All right, well, welcome back. Last week, we jumped around a little bit, touching some different topics because we were laying foundations for what we're going to talk about this week. So I want to review really quick. Last week, we talked about how God can be one being and three persons. And so Lewis used the analogy of a cube is made up of many squares. And so God is a sort of three-dimensional personality. Um, we talked about God is probably outside of time. Uh, Lewis doesn't, uh, this isn't in the Bible, but Lewis thinks that God doesn't have a past and a future. All moments are the present for him. I liked that. I like that too. And then the last thing we talked about, and I think it's the most important, was we discussed the difference between making and begetting. When you make something, it's unlike you. When you beget something, you create something that is like you. And so the Bible talks about us being made in the image of God, but we don't have the same kind of life that God has. And so Lewis uses the analogy of a statue. A statue looks like a person, but it doesn't have the same kind of life. And so we are statues, and the idea in the Bible is that someday some of us are going to come to life, going to turn from statues into real people. So with that, we're going to jump into chapter 4, Good Infection. And the first thing we're going to do is Lewis says, let's do some collective imagination. I want you all to picture a table. And on that table, we're going to put two books, one on top of the other. You all got that? Now, I hope we all agree that the position of the top book is caused by the bottom book. If the bottom book wasn't there, the top book would not be where it is. So the position of the top book is caused by the bottom book. We're all agreed on that? Now, let's imagine this could never happen, of course, but we can imagine it. If these books were like that for all eternity. Now, it would still be true that the top book is in its place as a result from the bottom book. But it's also true that there was never a time when the bottom book was there before the top book. The bottom book wouldn't have come first. Now, we're talking about this because we want to get this idea fixed. Because at, whenever we talk about God, we talk about God being three persons while still being one being. But as soon as we try to talk about the relationship of these persons, we talk as if one of them came first. We call one the Father and another one the Son. We speak of one begetting the other. So Lewis wants to, Lewis thinks it's important to make clear how something can be the source or cause of something else without being there before. Another example is, Lewis says, I asked you to imagine the books, and probably most of you did. That is, you, you performed an act of imagination, and in your head appeared a mental picture. But it wasn't you started imagining, and a few moments later the picture appeared. As soon as you engaged in the act, the, the picture appeared. So Lewis says, if there were a being who had always existed, and had always been imagining one thing, his act would have always been producing a mental picture. But the picture would be just as eternal as the act. In the same way, we must think of the sun always, so to speak, streaming forth from the Father, like light from a lamp, or heat from a fire, or thoughts from a mind. He is the self-expression of the Father, what the Father has to say. And there never was a time when he was not saying it. But have you noticed what is happening? All these pictures of light or heat are making it sound as if the father and son were two things instead of two persons. So that after all, the New Testament picture of a father and a son turns out to be much more accurate than anything we can try to substitute for it. That is what always happens when you go away from the words of the Bible. It is quite, quite all right to go away from them for a moment in order to make some special point clear. But you must always go back. Naturally, God knows how to describe himself much better than we know how to describe him. He knows that father and son is more like the relation between the first and second persons than anything else we can think of. Much the most important thing to know is that it is a relation of love. The father delights in his son. The son looks up to his father. 
And this brings us to the Christian idea that God is love. The idea that God is love only makes sense if God is more than one person. Love is something that one person feels, or more accurately does, for someone else. If God is just one person, then before the world was made, he's not love, because there's no one else. Christians believe that the living dynamic, dynamic activity of love has been going on forever in God, and is responsible for creating everything else. Lewis says, in Christianity, God is not a static thing, not even a person, but a dynamic, pulsating activity, a life, almost a kind of drama, almost, if you will not think me irreverent, a kind of dance. The union between the Father and the Son is such a live, concrete thing that this union itself is also a person. I know this is almost inconceivable, but look at it thus. You know that among human beings, when they get together in a family, or a club, or a trade union, people talk about the spirit of that family, or club, or trade union. They talk about its spirit because the individual members, when they are together, do really develop particular ways of talking and behaving which they would not have if they were apart. This corporate behavior may, of course, be either better or worse than their individual behavior. It is as it is as if a sort of communal personality came into existence. As a quick aside, if anyone has been to one of my family reunions, you know how true this is. That when all the brothers are together, it's a very different experience than when you encounter us individually. <laughs> it, it is as if... <laughs> you should beware. It is as if a sort of communal personality came into existence. Of course, it is not a real person, it is only rather like a person. But that is just one of the differences between God and us. What grows out of the joint life of the father and son is a real person, <coughs> is in fact the third of the three persons who are God. Now this third person is, in Christian terminology, called the Holy Ghost, or the Spirit of God. Lewis says, don't worry if you find him a bit more shadowy or vague in your mind than the other two. Lewis says, that seems, I think, natural, because you're not usually looking at him. He is usually acting through you. If we imagine the Father as something that's out there, it's our goal that we're pursuing, and if we imagine the Son, Christ, as the road that we're walking along, or as someone beside us helping us, then the Holy Spirit is something that is behind you, pushing you on, or inside of you, giving you motive power. And finally, what does it all matter? It matters more than anything else in the world. The whole dance, or drama, or pattern of this three personal life is to be played out in each one of us. Each one of us has got to enter that pattern, take his place in the dance. There is no other way to the happiness for which we were made. Good things, as well as bad, are caught by a kind of infection. If you, went, if you want to get warm, you must stand near the fire. If you want to get wet, you must get into the water. If you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get close to, or even into, the thing that has them. They are not a sort of prize which God could, if he chose, just hand out to anyone. They are a great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. If you are close to it, the spray will wet you. If you are not, you will remain dry. Once a man is united to God, how could he not live forever? Once a man is separated from God, what could he do but wither and die? You remember what I said in chapter 1 about begetting and making. We are not begotten by God. We are only made by him. In our natural state, we are not sons of God, only, so to speak, statues. We have not got zoe, or spiritual life, only bios, or biological life, which is presently going to run down and die. Now the whole offer which Christianity makes is this, that we can, if we let God have his way, come to share in the life of Christ. If we do, we shall then be sharing a life which was begotten not made. 
which always has existed and always will exist. Christ is the Son of God. If we share in this kind of life, we shall be sons of God. We shall love the Father as he does, and the Holy Ghost will arise in us. He came to this world and became a man in order to spread to other men the kind of life he has, by what I call good infection. Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. That was chapter 4, Good Infection. Before we start the next one, are there any questions or comments? I know that's kind of a heavy thing we just covered. Chapter 5, The Obstinate Toy Soldier. Tin, yeah, toy soldiers. I love this first line, how Lewis starts it. He says, The Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. If the human race had never fallen, would Bios, would our natural life, have been drawn up into Zoe at birth, as a matter of course? Lewis says, I don't know. We don't know what would have been, but we do know our current situation, and it's thus. Not only are the two kinds of life different, they always would have been different, but they're actually opposed. Our natural life is something self-centered, something that wants to be petted and admired, it wants to exploit others and even the universe. And most of all, it wants to be left alone, and it definitely wants to stay away from anything that is better or stronger than it. <clears throat> Lewis says, it's quite like people who are raised to be dirty hate taking baths. And Bios is quite right. It knows that if Zoe gets a hold of it, it's going to kill all its self-centeredness. It's ready to fight tooth and nail. Did you ever think, when you were a child, what fun it would be if your toys could come to life? Well, suppose you could really have brought them to life. Imagine turning a tin soldier into a real little man. It would involve turning the, the tin into flesh. And suppose the tin soldier did not like it. He is not interested in flesh. All he sees is that the tin is being spoiled. He thinks you are killing him. He will do everything he can to prevent you. He will not be made into a man if he can help it. What you would have done about the tin soldier I do not know. But what God did about us was this. The second person in God, the Son, became human himself, was born into the world as an actual man, a real man of a particular height, with a hair of a particular color, speaking a particular language, weighing so many pounds. The eternal being who knows everything and who created the whole universe became not only a man, but before that a baby, and before that a fetus inside a woman's body. If you want to get the hang of it, Think how you would like to become a slug or a crab. The result of this was that you now had one man who really was what all men were intended to be. One man in whom the created life, derived from his mother, allowed itself to be completely and perfectly turned into the begotten life. The natural human creature in him was taken up fully into the divine son. Thus, in one instance, humanity had, so to speak, arrived had passed into the life of Christ. And because the whole difficulty for us is that the natural life has to be, in a sense, killed, he chose an earthly career which involved the killing of his human desires at every turn. Poverty, misunderstanding from his own family, betrayal by one of his intimate friends, being jeered at and manhandled by the police, and execution by torture. And then, after being thus killed, killed every day in a sense, the human creature in him, because it was united to the divine Son, came to life again. The man in Christ rose again, not only the God. That is the whole point. For the first time, we saw a real man. One tin soldier, real tin, just like all the rest, had come fully and splendidly alive. But we now reach the point where the analogy breaks down. If one of your tin soldiers can, comes to life, 
Obviously, that doesn't really do anything for all the other ten soldiers. Lewis says that's not so with people. We look separate because you see us all walking about separately, but that's because we can only see the present. If you could see all of time, like God does, you would see that for most of time, that everyone is a part of their parents, and before that, their grandparents. If you could see all of time, you wouldn't see humanity dotted about as individuals, but like a great growing thing, like a very complicated tree. You would also see how not separate it is from God, who's keeping the whole thing going. Lewis says, it's not like if you could become a little tin soldier. It's like something affecting the whole mass of humanity gets added to it. It's like a disease, but a good disease, spreading through a whole tree. Like adding a drop of something to a glass of water, which changes the color or the taste of the whole thing as it spreads through it. Of course, none of these illustrations work perfectly. In the long run, God is no one but himself, and what he does is like nothing else. You could hardly expect it to be otherwise. What, then, is the difference which he has made to the whole human mass? It is just this, that the business of becoming a son of God, of being turned from a created thing into a begotten thing, of passing over from the temporary biological life into timeless spiritual life, has been done for us. Humanity is already saved in principle. We individuals have to appropriate that salvation. But the really tough work, the bit we could not have done for ourselves, has been done for us. We have not got to try to climb up into spiritual life by our own efforts. It has already come down into the human race. If we will only lay ourselves open to the one man in whom it was fully present, and who, in spite of being God, is also a real man, he will do it in us and for us. Remember what I said about good infection. One of our own race has this new life. If we get close to him, we shall catch it from him. That was chapter 5, The Obstinate Toy Soldiers. The last chapter here is titled Two Notes, and we're just going to wrap up a couple loose ends. There's one question and one possible misunderstanding that Lewis wants to address. The first question Lewis received from a critic who asked, If God wanted many sons, why didn't he beget many sons at the beginning, instead of going through the rather difficult process of creating natural creatures and then spiritualizing them? Well, Lewis says, there's two answers to this, one that's fairly easy and the other that's kind of difficult to grasp. The question, could it have been different, loses all meaning when applied to God. He says, facts in our world are all dependent on other facts. The example he uses is, the letters in this book would have been red if the printer had been instructed to use red ink. He would have been instructed to use red ink if I had wanted it to be red. I would have wanted it to be red if, and so on and so on and so on. But when you come to God, you come to the fundamental, unalterable fact upon which all other facts are built. I love what he says here, just really quick. It's, it is nonsensical to ask if it could have been otherwise. It is what it is, and there is an end of the matter. But then he says, even apart from that problem, he says, I struggle to imagine the father beginning many sons before all worlds. Remember last week we said that Christ was begotten before all worlds, so we're not allowed to bring any kind of nature into it. Lewis says, Without any kind of nature, I can imagine the father and son because the relationship to each other is different. The father is not related to the son the same way that the son is related to the father. The the father begets, the son is begotten. The father pours out, the son receives. But if you have many sons, then the father would be related to them all in the same way. And they would all be related to each other in the same way. How would you tell them apart? Of course, some people say that they have no problem imagining a father begetting many sons. But Lewis says, when you actually pry them about it, 
you tend to see that they are imagining kind of a big central figure surrounded by uh, other figures around them. In other words, you've had to smuggle in bodies in some kind of space. Or you've smuggled in the idea of nature. When I stop doing that and try to think of the father begetting many sons before all worlds, I find I'm not really thinking of anything. The idea fades away into mere words. Was nature, space, and time and matter created precisely in order to make manyness possible? Is there perhaps no other way of getting many eternal spirits except by first making many natural creatures in a universe and then spiritualizing them? But of course, this is all guesswork. Meaning, we're in very deep water, it's not, not really anything to put your feet on, and it's not the most important question in the book. So, The next idea that Lewis wanted to get straightened out is we talked about the idea of humanity being one big thing, like a very complicated tree. Lewis says, we don't want to confuse this with two bad ideas. The first is, we don't want to confuse it with the idea that individual differences don't matter. They do. We also don't want to confuse it with the idea that people, individuals, are less important than collectives, like classes and races. Individuals are more important. Lewis says, separate things look very similar. Six pennies all look alike. How are they separate? By taking up different space and having different atoms. But all the parts of an organism could be very different. He says, my nose and my lungs are very different. They are only alive because they are both parts of my body and they share in its common life. Christians think that people are not members of groups, like the pennies, or items on a list, but organs in a body, all different, all contributing something that no other could. He says, when you find in yourself the desire to turn your children, students, and even neighbors into people just like you, remember God probably never meant them to be. You and they are different organs. On the other hand, if you find yourself tempted to not bother about your neighbors, to leave them alone because it's no business of yours, rem remember that though they are different parts of the same organism, well, remember that though they are different, they are part of the same organism. His life and yours are the same. If you forget that other people are part of the same organism, you will become an individualist. If you forget that people are different organs and try to suppress differences, you will be a totalitarian. But a Christian must not be either. Lewis says, I feel a strong desire to tell you and I expect you feel a strong desire to tell me which of these two errors is worse. That is the devil getting at us. He always sends errors into the world in pairs, pairs of opposites. And he always encourages us to spend a lot of time thinking which is the worse. You see why, of course. He relies on your extra dislike of one error to draw you gradually into the opposite one. But do not let us be fooled. We have to keep our eyes on the goal and go straight through between both errors. We have no other concern than that with either of them. That was chapter six, two notes. Next week, we're gonna look at chapter seven, let's pretend. Chapter eight, <clears throat> is Christianity easy or hard? And then chapter nine, counting the cost. But for now, that's all I have to say about that.